Hubert Angel declares that there's no such thing as generational curses. Now I want you all to know that he is dead wrong. Full disclosure, I reached out to Abednego some time ago to have a discussion, either private or publicly, about this issue regarding generational curses. I think it is that important because what's happening is people are literally being mentally, not spiritually, bound to something that the Bible does not preach or teach. However, we've got some people who I don't think are taking the time to do their studying, to do their due diligence and actually find out what the scriptures say. Abednego, I said before, I do like the young brother. Uh, I like him calling out the things that should be called out warning people. But I think some maybe it might be that he's just too close or too involved with the, the charismatic movement to where he's not willing to call out or to divorce himself from things that are not in the scriptures. This issue of generational curses is something that's just taught by other people who I will tell you without any hesitation, they tend to not know the scriptures. They're more emotional than they are scriptural. Uh, they are by their feelings or what they've been taught more than they are biblical. And here is the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video uh, from Abednego and we're going to walk through this and we're going to see so many gross errors. And I mean, really gross errors. Now, I also want to bring something else as well. When I have this conversation, I think I understand why people don't want to have the conversation because I think that maybe they realize that they don't stand on good biblical ground. So I stated that I wanted to have the conversation with him and he, he declined, which is fine. That That's his right. I didn't have to. He felt like that uh, it wouldn't be fruitful. OK, but when you go and make a video like the one we're going to look at, uh, you open yourself to scrutiny when you say some things that are just not even close to being biblical. As a matter of fact, you refute yourself and the scriptures do even when some of the scriptures that he goes to um, are shown. But it should also be pointed out that uh, I've left a, a comment or two before on some other videos, not really all that critical, but I noticed something. I noticed that I was blocked. And so I'm going to demonstrate to you in this little video right now that here I am blocked. Now, this is me making a comment on that particular video. If you look, look if you look at it, this is, I'm not sure the person who, is, who this is, but look who I'm, I'm below. Someone, I'm not sure, I expect this is a little bit bigger, someone named Michael, um, whatever. And then below, this is from In Between Sa Saved by Grace. And you can see uh, here, it shows that this is from my particular account, from the Smart Christian account. That part, it shows, if I look on that account, it shows a comment is there. There's no uh, likes or dislikes or anything like that, what have you. But when I go to my own personal account that hadn't been blocked because he didn't know to block it, when I go to that particular account, you look here again, and right below the same people, this person, Michael, and above this person, Saved by Grace, not there. Now, we know this is my other account because I'll, I, if I just, let me move this down. If you scroll up, you can see that this is from my Corey Minor account, the little red that says Be Smart. This is my own personal account. Well, so I've been blocked, at least in that regard. Now, I don't know if I've been blocked anywhere else. I don't know. But here, I've been blocked. I don't understand why, uh, but fine. But I, I thought that needed to be brought out. Again, I'm not bothered. I'm not angry. I'm not, in, I'm not anything. I just wanted to be known that this is what's happening. This is where I'm standing. And so I couldn't even, if I wanted to, just to call and say, hey, you think this, you think that. That tends to be the case. But with, anyway, that being the case, let's go ahead and look at the video and you're going to see a multitude of errors. Hubert Angel declares that there's no such thing as generational curses. Now, I want you all to know that he is dead wrong, right? I'm going to play this video for you guys. But I must let you know that when we're talking about generational curses, we're talking about generational cycles due to giving place to the devil. Now, right, he's, he changes it. He says, we're not talking about generational curses. We're talking about generational cycles. Well, if Uber Angel is talking about generational curses, then why are you saying that he's dead wrong? Unless you're talking about the same thing, you're just giving it a different name. By the way, not on all of Uber Angel's uh, rationale is not correct, but his overall premise and I, I do not think that Uber Angel is an actual uh, teacher of the Lord. I do not think that at all. But his his final conclusion is correct. There are no generational curses. So he confuses us right off the bat in terms of what does what is meant by generational curses. He says generational cycles. Let's just back up. First of all, if there is there's two words that are in play, generational and curses, meaning that someone has cursed you 
and also curse the generations coming behind you as a result of what you've done. So the children will incur penalty because of what you've done. Now, understand that I can curse someone has no weight, no power, no backing to it because it's just me. I don't have the weight to, to, to do anything about it because the word curse means to esteem lightly, to loathe, to look down on and to treat that way. Well, if it's God that curses you or curses someone, well, that's a big thing. If it's me or someone else, if it's a fourth grader who does so, doesn't have any case, that, that doesn't do anything for you, but that needs to be understood. And so was there a such thing as generational curses in the Bible? Sure. The Bible tells us that. Who did the cursing? God. Who did he curse? Israel. Why? Because of disobedience. And he made it show so that even not just them, but the generations after that would be affected. However, even though we speak about generational curses up to a certain point in the Old Testament, and you can bring those up, which he does, not understanding how to read the Bible. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I don't think he grasps how you ought to actually read the Bible. Generational curses are spoken of in the Old Testament, but as we move forward, God tells us he's not going to be, or he's not going to bring about a generational curses. As a matter of fact, he's going to end generational curses. How do I know? Because in Jeremiah chapter 31, let's start in verse 29. He says that in those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the children's teeth are ruined because the father did something. And so revisiting these iniquities upon the third and fourth generation because what the fathers did, he is going to end that. He says that is going to be taken away in those days. They will not say that. He says, but everyone will die for his own iniquity, his own sin. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth will be set on it. So those days are coming. Those days have already come. So now you are responsible for your own sin. So we're talking about a generational curse, a curse that is levied on to the future generation based on what their forefathers or descendants, or I'm sorry, or ancestors did. That's a generational curse. Now, if you want to change the name, the title to generational cycles, what does that mean? Now, let's not confuse curses what happens in one generation, the next generation as a curse with an actual cycle or consequence. And I shouldn't even use the word cycle. The word consequence is, is, is better. Um, people think that if the mother did it, the father, the, the children going to do it, the child's going to do it. We see that happening because maybe the child is not taught properly or group in that environment, but it's not a curse because the, any all it takes is some different uh, choices, a different movement some way. So if I grew up in a household that was poor, it's not it's not guaranteed or even assumed, nor should it be assumed that I will also be in poverty. I can go out and get a job. I can get an education and get hired with a well-paying job or create a job or start my own business, what have you. That's the case. But you're going to hear his rationale in a second. But let's go back to the video about the third and fourth generation with um, God disciplining and going down the generations. And we're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about giving place to the devil with you and your children, all right? I'm, I'm, we're gonna talk about this because it's more so of a spiritual thing giving place to the devil, all right? Now, before we go there, we're gonna also bring up this issue of what does it mean to give place to the devil? These people that I've talked to, that I've asked, I've spoken to him. Um, I've asked Marcus Rogers. I've asked um, Pagani, no response. I've asked Signor, I've all asked these people to give a response to generational curses. They cannot what they will now they'll make a video about it they'll speak about it but they will not address what i'm bringing up and you've seen the time before that i brought it up and there was a, a dialogue in in the text message conversations where he was actually in, included he never responded but god never responded marcus rogers did and again there are no scripts there's no scriptural basis if you're going to say something that's not in the scriptures then you're making it up if you're going to make up something that's not in the scriptures or you misinterpret the scriptures you simply need to be quiet you need to stop teaching. This is not me saying this. this is what the Bible says. James says that there will be a stricter consequence or stricter judgment for those teachers who are doing things really knowingly in error. We're all going to get something wrong, but when it's pointed out and you keep teaching this, then God is going to ultimately deal with you. So let's play this video, then we'll refute it with the word of God. A lie. There's nothing called generational case. I know what you think. You think, but your uncle used to do the things that you're doing now. Who is not doing it? 
the things you are doing right now is done by another white guy who is not related to you whatsoever if it's generational case that means you, you are british say i'm also I, I, my family everyone just divorces i'm also divorcing the white person sitting next to you today the indian the chinese sitting next to you is divorced so are they in your generation no those are happenings that happen in people's lives people divorce but demons know if you believe in generational cases you have already said i'm not part of the generation of jesus so they will come and now let me just say that he's he's off on some things but that right there he's absolutely on you keep saying that you are have are victim of these generational curses uh, then what you're doing is you're, you're, you're making it in your head. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. I'm under some generational curse. Well, uh, the fact that you're saying it, we now, no one is refusing that there are, there's demonic influence. We don't, we don't, we all agree with that. And so you, what you're doing is you're now playing into the hands of these demonic influence. Imagine that you didn't have one, but now you're, now you're playing into some sort of demonic influence because, all they've got to do is bring other people who are not believers your way to make it seem that way. Someone who's against maybe your boss or anyone else. Things can happen and you're giving credit to it rather than focusing on the fact that you have been set free. We'll talk about that some more. But obviously, a Abednego, you just look on his face, he's not he's not agreeing with this. But in this case, what he's stating, uh, and it's kind of weird, me agreeing with Uber Angel. But in this case, I do and cause a similar thing to the one that happened in your grandfather so that you believe that this is a generational case and the moment you believe it you remove jesus out of the equation because that's true you believe it jesus is no longer in the in the uh, uh in the equation we'll, we'll cover that again because when jesus came he removed you from that generation and put him in the jesus generation so is there a generational case yes for fools Ooh, that means he didn't like that. Yes, for fools, but he's he's correct. Foolish people believe in generational curses. Not that you are a fool, but you're foolish. Let me say that again. Foolish people believe in generational curses. You can't point to a scripture. The only scripture that you point to is Ephesians four twenty seven about giving place to the devil, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that and show what that means. No one believes. No no one with any credibility should ever believe that that is speaking about generational curses. By the way, it's the very same verse that you guys have used to say that people can have demons. Well, which one is it? It's the things that your grandparents did cannot affect you. Why? As long as you are in Jesus, for you to be affected by a generational curse. Jesus is to join your generation. So why do we preach about generational cases? Because we have some that have accepted it, that there is generational cases. Oh, straight foolishness. Straight foolishness, like I said. No, it's not. No, it's not. And we're going to just refute everything that you said because with all due respect, brother, I like you, but what you were getting ready to speak about and teach about is even more foolish. I said generational cycles exist due to giving place to the devil because the bible says that you got to understand that parents are accountable for their children's spiritual spiritual life physical life emotional life mental life and whatnot so if a parent practices witchcraft or uh, lives a life of wickedness they invite demons and because children are not accountable for their own souls and whatnot those same spirits are now transferred to the children the children well that's not necessarily true that that the children are not accountable for their own souls. Yes, they are. Now, as an infant, as a baby, well, okay, I see that point. But what about the eight-year-old, the 10-year-old, the 15-year-old, the 14-year-old? Does he get to go to heaven because mommy was a jerk, daddy was no good? No, uh, he must He must place his faith in Christ. And you're saying that because someone grew up a certain way, because the parents were a certain way, that that's the way with the kids? No, this is, this is, not, this is not even close to being sane. Children begin to inherit it, the spirits, right? The Bible says, wait a second. And we're, we're going to go through this entire video. It's not very long, but we inherit spirits. Passage. First Corinthians four, six says, uh, Paul is teaching us not learn, not to exceed what is written. Where is that text that says that we have, or we can inherit spirits? You're making it up. That's why you should not be teaching, at least on this, you should not. And if you're going to say that about this, where, what else are you making things up on? It says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. 
So if you, and you know what, I wasn't going to do this, but let me let me go ahead and take time to pull it up. He, he speaks about Deuteronomy 30. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and curses. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Now, he takes that that if you don't, then obviously your descendants are going to suffer. Well, again, when is this taking place? He, again, this is why it's important to learn how to read the Bible and do it contextually. This is Israel getting ready to go. They haven't done it yet, but on their way into the land. We know they're going to be disobedient. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 10, God tells them to do what? Fix your heart, circumcise your heart, get your heart right. Make sure that inwardly you are ready. They never do. As a matter of fact, in this very same chapter, if he wants to just obliterate his argument to think that these generational curses are going to be forever and they still apply today, just go to the first part of Gen uh, Deuteronomy 3. At the very beginning of Deuteronomy 3, God is speaking about these curses that he's going to bring upon them. He says, so it shall be when all of these things come about upon you, the blessings and curses which I set before you and call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord God has banished you. So before they even go into the land, God is telling them that I'm going to banish you out of that land in the future. But then he's going to he's going to bring them back. He says, verse two, and you return to the Lord, your God. Uh, and obey him with all your heart, according to all you that I command you today, you and your son. So what's going to happen at some point in time, their sons are going to come back. Look what he says, though. Uh, if your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, God said, I'm going to bring you back. And look at verse six. More of the Lord, your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all that and, and that you may live. Well, what is he speaking of? Israel is going to be under this particular curse. God is going to Put, is, is going to punish Israel for their disobedience. But then, as we read in Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 18, he is going to do something with their heart, and then they will love the Lord as well as their descendants. But he says that's when that end of these curses are going to go away, the curses that are being pronounced upon them. This is why it's important to read the Bible and understand the context of it, understand the story that the Bible is laying out for all of us. If you choose the path of wickedness, uh, uh, the path of, you know, just evil, adultery, sorcery, the children that you will give birth to or the children you will raise, they will also begin to follow that pattern physically and spiritually. And if they don't follow the pattern physically, they'll follow it. They'll, they'll be bound by it spiritually. So if you do this, your children will that. That is a that, that's a ridiculous statement to say. If you're if if you were involved in something, whatever, then that means your children will be involved and bound either physically or spiritually. Again, notice the lack of scriptures that he's given because there are none. And then two, notice even anecdotally how that's not even true. And he's going to give us other examples. But it's just not true. So the demons that have entered will also now affect the children. And this is why the Bible says that um, uh, in Proverbs 22, verse six, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So when we train up our children in the way of wickedness, or if we are wicked and we do not go through deliverance or renounce our wickedness, our children will be partakers of that wickedness. Uh, David said in Psalms chapter 51, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So there's no such thing as an innocent baby or innocent. But it has nothing to do with a demon, and it has nothing to do with a curse. Uh, if you train a child according to his bent, his, 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 his natural bent, if the child, and this is what Deuteronomy, I mean, Deuteronomy, what Proverbs 22, 6 is saying. Um, but if you train a child according to his natural bent, if he is a selfish child, then when he's old, he'll be selfish. If he, if he is a, um, uh, an undisciplined child, he'll be undisciplined when he gets older. If he's not clean, then when he gets older, he'll be not clean. That's what this passage is speaking of. But notice he never brings up anything about curses or or demons or, or any any spirits being passed along again abednego love you brother but you're just making it up it's in child or anything like that you will inherit the wickedness and the iniquity spiritually 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 from your parents now her, let's talk about hereditary diseases you go to the doctors and they say okay your mother had cancer it's gonna be likely for you to have cancer that this is hereditary diseases you have cancer that's not even medically true because your parents had cancer you were likely to that's not even true at all Think of it. that's not true. Now, could there be some markers? Sure, sure. But you're not guaranteed or even likely. But in some cases, there are some things that are passed down, uh, you know, by by uh, your, your, your mother or your father. But not always. As a matter of fact, not even in most cases. 
that's just medically untrue. Cancer, your mother had cancer, um, your great grandmother had cancer. There are some things that are natural, then there are things that are spiritual. But the issue is that anything that is a theme generationally, generationally in people's lives, we accredit it to the natural or just the consequence of eating bad and whatnot. And that is foolishness because we see within the scriptures, there was- That's not foolishness. If your mother was fat, your father was fat, that means you're gonna be fat. But if you're gonna eat the same food that she ate or he ate, if you're gonna eat McDonald's every day, if you're not gonna work out, sit on the couch, eat uh, donuts and drink sodas, yeah, you're gonna be fat. But that's not because of them, that's because of you. And there's no demon behind that. This is bad. There was children who had the spirit of infirmity. There was children who had the spirit of infirmity. Jesus came to a man, uh, there was a man that came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, you know, I brought this mute, my, my, my child is mute. He can't speak. I brought him to your disciples. They could not cast it out. And Jesus said, how long has this been going on? And he said, since childhood. So what did that child have to do since his childhood to acquire a spirit of infirmity? It must have been something generational he inherited or he was a victim of witchcraft. There must have been some type of open door. The parents failed. Foolishness, foolishness, foolishness. It's just unbiblical. This is just sophomore. And I'm sorry, Abednego, uh, you probably want to block me some more. But where in that text does it say that this child inherited something like that? No, that now you're saying the father or the mother must have done something involved in some witchcraft. No, as a matter of fact, the father even says that he believes. The father literally tells Jesus, I believe but help my unbelief. In other words, I believe, but I do struggle with some of my faith sometimes. Fine. But where do you get that the father or the mother or someone else was dabbling in witchcraft? You're adding to the text. Don't add to the text. Don't add or take away what the text is saying. You should not listen. If this is how anyone is going to teach, don't teach. Save yourself the trouble from God having to step in and deal with you because what you're doing is you're literally adding to the text. Can someone point that out in the scripture where this boy's father, uh, or his mother or someone else did something to cause him to incur this? In some type of way, right? And when we go to the scripture um, in John chapter nine, verse one through two, right? The disciples are walking and they see a blind man and they ask Jesus a question. It reads this. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was, who was blind from birth. And now I want you all to pay attention to this. He is literally, we're gonna read the passage and you might not even wanna hear what he has to say going forward, but listen to what he says and then we'll read the passage. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the disciples asked this question because they had the understanding that it's possible to be born blind or have an infirmity because of the sins of the parents. Now, this infirmity. So he says they're asking questions because it's possibly born, born blind because of the sins of the parents. Keep that in mind. Infirmity is usually a demon. It's usually a demon that's causing the infirmity. And we see this in Luke chapter 13, verse 11. Now, before we go forward, what did the passage say? If, if you want to use this to say that um, people will receive this now, clearly in this passage, he says that it was no one's sin, but so that the Lord could get glory. So if you're going to start saying that people receive these things because of what their parents did or something like that or whatever, no, Jesus is telling us, in, especially in this case, that no one's sin was involved. Now, the disciples are asking this question. Uh, he says that they're asking this question because they believe that it's possible for it to happen. Well, we don't have a, we don't have one scripture to make that statement. We have not one scripture that tells us that um, someone is receiving a demon, some demonic force that's passed down. So rather than inheriting um, the, the family house or inheriting the family chariot or a plot of land or gold or money, no, you inherit a demon there's just no biblical basis. And so literally Abednego is unbiblical in this teaching. 11, how there was a woman who was bent over for 18 years. Jesus said she had the spirit of infirmity. Uh, Luke 13, verse 10 through 11. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. So this woman had a demon causing her to be infirm, causing her to have some type of weakness and sickness. But where did the demon come from? She inherited, is this a generational curse? Yes, it was a demon. Now the issue with the world today or some Christians today is they accredit every illness, every sickness, every cycle, every theme in, in the bloodline to natural causes, or it's just a consequence of just doing something stupid. In all reality, there are many spiritual consequences that people are dealing with. And you are impacted by the sins of your parents. It, 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 you just are. It's not God disciplining you, but you are impacted with what your grandparents have done too. If your grandparents are poor, your parents are poor, unless they break out of it, 
and, and do something with their time and prayer and fasting and, you know, but your parents can be poor, like, be poor, be poor likely, then you will also be poor. It's just stupid. That's just stupid. I'm sorry. Not saying that he is, but that's a stupid statement. Um, if your parents, by the way, the reason why children are poor, the, the reason why if my mother was poor and I was poor because I was in her household, but once I left the household, no longer the case. So it's just a ridiculous statement. It's not even factually, not even secularly true. If your parents were born with a sickness, it's likely for, you know, that to be your reality. So this whole thing that what my mom did, what my dad did, what our parents did not affect me, it's not true. It's not true. You were born into a household where you're like, I regret this. Some of us have been born into households of, of generational poverty, generational cancer, generational this, 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 all these different things. Y'all feel me? No, we don't, because nothing you said is true. It's not biblically true. It's not medically true. It's not uh, as far as social social standards, uh, measurements, uh, measuring someone's uh, the poverty rate amongst people. Now, can someone uh, learn bad habits from their parents? Sure. But the only thing that can change or what can change that is a simple change of mind. Course correction. Go to school. Get a good job. Marry. I don't know. Marry in the wealth. Get the lottery. Whatever. There are so many things. The issue is who is causing this? It's on the person. And so, yeah, we teach responsibility. People ought to be responsible. And ultimately, you are responsible for yourself. But you're putting the onus on some demon. That's a huge problem with that. And that's why uh, what you're doing is a huge disservice. This is why Uber Angel make this statement. He says he spoke about how you think about Jesus. You are really and, and honestly discrediting Jesus. You think that what Jesus did was of no effect or you or you have diminished it. Jesus says that whom the son sets free, you are free in D. This word ontos, you are actually really, truly, thoroughly free. No, really, really, you are free. That's what the word means. You are really free. But then here comes Abednego or anyone else, Marcus Rogers or Pagani or anyone else. No, you're not really free. Jesus, Jesus, we gotta, we have to better understand what he's saying or Jesus was wrong. And then if I come along and lay my hands on you, I can get rid of those generational curses. No, sorry. I'm sorry. The scriptures prove you are in error. Like, like this stuff is real. This stuff is real. When we say generational curses, we're talking about cycles due to giving place to the devil. And when you give place to the devil, you're allowing the devil to steal, kill, and destroy in the way that he wants to in your life. So what he's doing, and granted, he's also mixing scriptures <laughs> but let's go to this passage. This passage in Ephesians 4.27. Matter of fact, let's start in 4.25. It says, laying aside every falsehood, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbors, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not yet sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Anger, And do not, excuse me, give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands, what is good so that he will have something to share. And we can keep on moving on and on and on about having no unwholesome speech come out of your mouth, things like that. But now, when we talk about giving an opportunity to the devil, and it's not, by the way, this is this is also used by people to say that this is where you can know a Christian can have a demon because you're giving him a geographic location on your body. This is, what, this is the passage they point to. So it can't be it's either a, geogra a geographical location or an actual opportunity. Well, what he's saying here is if you do something, let's say I, oh, I don't know, I'm angry, uh, or in this case, use this example, I'm angry. Well, what happens if I stay angry? I can, I can then turn it into some sort of sin. I can give an opportunity for the devil to use that. Maybe bring, have you ever, have you ever been mad at someone? been angry and then you tell someone who probably isn't saved because we want to find someone else we can vent to that person didn't say yeah and they're going to kind of egg you on next thing you know you're in a fight next thing you know you're saying things uh, nasty about the person on on facebook what have you doing all sorts of ungodly things because you're giving an opportunity for the devil to come in and use someone else to use you to give a bad witness now is that a demon no are you possessed no is that a generational curse or as he would say a generational cycle no it's not it's Foolish what he's saying. Learn the scriptures if you're going to teach them. And because your children are not accountable for their own spirits and their own souls, 
that force of darkness will begin to now legally be able to afflict your children. And man, they uh, say these this weird this weird thing about legally being able to do. Where do we get this? There, there's no such thing about this legal decrees or anything like that out of heaven or anything like that. There, wh where do you get this from? And now it's a stronghold, and it'll be it'll now move generationally. And if that demon is not casted out, if that covenant is not broken, the children will continue to be bound by the, the door that the parents opened. Really? So who broke the covenant, let's say, in, in my household or your household or someone else? May, maybe your parent wasn't wasn't a believer, wasn't a Christian, and you became one. How'd, how'd that happen? Your parent didn't do that. No demon was cast out. You just simply placed your faith in Christ. Ah, oh, that's how that works. If you place your faith in Christ, or if James says, if you just simply uh, resist the devil, he'll flee, draw closer to him, and God will draw closer to you. That's how that works. See, when a, a child is born, they don't have the ability to have faith and believe and receive Jesus Christ, right, for protection. So the parents are the ones that have to continually pray, 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 pray. Now, if the parent is a witch, the parent can sacrifice that child. And that child will be under a demonic covenant from the parents, right? A demonic covenant from the parent that sacrificed them. And then if the child now has... By the way, what what actually is what is a demonic covenant? I mean, if we're making up stuff, make up an answer that makes sense. What is a demonic covenant? Children growing up, the, they will still be under that covenant, and the child will not know that they were sacrificed by their mother, and it will keep going because spiritually there was a legal covenant. And this is why we see through Eve, Eve sinned, and then we have all we are all paying the price because of what Eve did. God cursed that. that cur well, first of all, we're not paying the price for what Eve did. We're paying the price for what. Adam did. Sin, sin entered the world through one man, through Adam. The Bible says he was a seed, but Adam sinned. So again, these are just basic errors that he's making uh, with the scriptures because he's trying to prove a point. Curse still remains, and that came from God, right? But because of what Eve did, Satan eternally has the ability to oppress, to afflict, and have the opportunity to tempt us so he can begin to find legal grounds to afflict us and rule our lives spiritually. He doesn't have any sort of legal grounds, and it's not eternally. Again, our words matter. It's important. And if he, it would be something to say, okay, he misspoke. He didn't misspeak. This is what he's teaching because he keeps saying, repeating the same things over and over again. Uh, and all these things. This is why uh, Apostle Paul said, give no place to the devil and do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. If the devil cannot operate in our lives, then we, then, then there's, then Apostle Paul wouldn't say that. You feel me? So we got to get to a place where we understand generational curses are really generational cycles. We have to have the understanding that generational curses are really just generational cycles. I have right? no idea, again, what he means by generational cycles because he equates the way he describes generational cycles. He describes them as the same as generational curses. Now, here's what the Bible says again. This, is, this, is, this should be the final word on it, but it's not because, again, you're so caught up in making things up because it's something you've been taught. You're into this whole charismania. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 13, Paul says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Christ became a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So here we're saying that Christ redeemed us from the curse. Christ became the curse so that we can still be cursed ourselves. Does that make any sort of sense? It makes no sense whatsoever. He's He's given us the spirit. He died for us. He showed us love. He resides in us, but we're under a curse. Does that make any, does that make any sort of sense? And it shouldn't because it's not even biblically uh, in the ballpark of what the Bible is teaching. This is why, uh, with all due respect to Ben and Go, you need to go back and just search the scripture. Just say, listen, I got that wrong. You can still be a charismatic and not believe in generational curses. You can be a charismatic all you want. You can still do what you're doing, but don't preach or teach someone they can be bound. It's what you're doing. It's a it's a it's a diabolical disservice to tell someone that they are bound and under a generational curses. My Lord, all the things that my family has gone through and done, you would think I'd be bound and bent over and so forth and have all the different things or my children. That ain't the case at all, at all. Why? Because we understand that the word has sovereign authority over us in our lives. The spirit leads us and moves us and has kept us safe. No matter what a demon does, you people are too concerned with demons. Where is a demon uh, around me? Is there a demon anywhere nearby? Don't know. Don't care. Why? Because there are angels by me. 
But even more than that, the Holy Spirit is here. Greater is he that's in me. Here's the scripture, Abednego. Greater is he, the Holy Spirit that's in me, than anyone or anything that's in the world, no matter what demon is, or no matter what bad teachings out there that says that I can have a demon or be bound by some sort of generational curse or consequences or cycle, whatever you want to call it. The Bible has made me victorious. As a matter of fact, and I'll end it with this. The Bible speaks about us who have been born of God. He says that he keeps us, God himself. He keeps us. And I want you to notice what he says, Bendigo, or anyone else. It says, Tere, which is he's the one that's keeping us. That's referring back to God himself. Yuantan. Yuantan, which is himself. So he himself is the one who keeps us. How do, and what's that mean? And the evil one cannot touch us. We can't be touched. So no, there are no generational curses, generational whatever, anything that that's some sort of legal decrees from heaven or from the devil or anything like that or whatever. Anyone else uh, not name uh, any of these guys are teaching that? Reject that teaching, please. Reject that teaching. Matter of fact, even hold them accountable. Make them make them make that biblically fit. Make them answer to every scriptural text that they have twisted or mangled or misunderstood because you are doing a huge disservice. You're causing people who should have joy to be defeated because something's happening in their life. These are people who will never learn how to trust in the goodness of the Lord when they're going through. They'll think that if I'm struggling here or struggling there, then it's a demon. And all it may simply be is the Lord is just wanting to grow them. Know that the test, the, these trials are testing your faith to grow you, to make you perfect and complete in him. Amen. Amen.